Well, let's get started. Uh, welcome to the college seminar. I'm privileged today to introduce uh, Dr. Lowell Kinsel from the EOH program. Uh, you came here to hear her talk, so I'm not going to give a long, uh, lengthy introduction. You can look up her CV online if you like. Um, she took her degrees from the University of Cincinnati in um, industrial hygiene and also occupational safety and ergonomics. And before coming here, she had appointments in some institution in Eugene, I think. I don't remember what it was. Uh, and also in Barcelona. Um, uh, her most uh, recent achievement, however, was announced just yesterday that she was promoted from assistant to associate professor. Uh, and so we're going to spend the next few minutes uh, seeing exactly why that was one of the easiest decisions that OSU has ever made. Thank you, Victor. And we also have to congratulate him because he went from associate to full professor, which is even more impressive than mine. Sorry, you're going to have to bear with me. All right, that should work. So um, I was asked today to come talk about some segment of my work. I do work with other industries, but a large portion of my research program has been um, with the commercial fishing industry. So I'm going to share with you one of the projects that actually Victor and I both have been heavily involved at since the inception. Um, I also do not work in isolation. It is a very collaborative project. So um, along with Victor, I have a PhD student, Laura, and I have a research assistant, Amelia Vaughn, that really make things go. And um, I work very closely with um, Katie Jacobson in the Oregon Sea Grant, which is the extension service um, out on the coast, um, who really links me with the commercial fishing communities and families. Um, we've had a, a, an array of students who also current and past students that work on that, on this project. And then it's also a cooperative agreement with the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, which under Trump's budget is getting cut completely. <laughs> so, so maybe I won't be talking about this work next year. But um, the NIOSH Western States office, which is located in Anchorage, um, my colleague um, Devin Lucas, who is also a graduate of our program, um, and Samantha Case, um, work on this project and this um, um, work. All of this has led, um, all of these projects, which I'll describe very briefly, the whole kind of um, portfolio of them, have led to a very recent um, a or an agreement, an actual partnership with our college um, and NIOSH. Um, they have a Center for Maritime Safety and Health Studies um, that's led by Dr. Jennifer Lincoln. So um, myself and her signed this agreement that we would kind of collaborate, collaborate um, and combine our expertise um, to advance the protection of maritime workers, so not only commercial but maritime workers. So that's an exciting um, nod to our work. So a brief overview of all of the research um, that's being done here at Oregon State University. It did initially start with Devin Lucas. You don't have to read all this. But when he was a PhD student here, he um, was very interested in looking at some of the policies that were um, in the commercial fishing industry, specifically with two fleets um, that are in Alaska. So his whole dissertation was focused on that, and that really what is what got me into this area and this industry. Um, well, after he left, my um, current PhD student, Laura, did receive a small funding grant to continue some of this work looking at non-fatal injuries um, in this industry. And so we did a small project um, <clears throat> that then led to a larger project. But in the meantime, we wrote this um, cooperative agreement to do the study that we're going to talk about today, which is this injury prevention in the West Coast Dungeness Crab Fleet. So we'll talk about crabbing only today. Um, and so that one is, um, has been ongoing since 2014, and we're still in the thick of it, to say the least. Um, in the meantime, uh, Laura did propose her dissertation. She's focusing on the seafood processors. As we were looking at non-fatal injuries, a lot of the vessels that are out there are called, um, they're fisher processors, so they not only fish for the seafood, but they also process at sea. And looking at all the injuries that occur there, it really piqued her interest in looking at that, not only at sea, but in onshore operations. And so um, she is currently working on her dissertation and hopes to defend um, by the end of 2017. So we hope um, to have all of that work published. Um, and then uh, um, one project that both Victor and I 
are involved with um, is looking, developing a more comprehensive surveillance system to really understand um, the vessel um, issues as well as the personnel issues, the, the injuries and illnesses um, in this industry. So won't be talking about that today, but that just started this year, basically at the end of 2016, and will be a five-year project unless all of our funding disappears. <laughs> Um, so the objective, the kind of purpose of all this work is that there's a need for um, quantitative risk assessments, um, in, specifically in the commercial fishing industry. Um, this was brought on um, Congress. Um, they did a reauthorization act um, in 2010 and said by 2020 they would have to develop alternative safety compliance um, principles for the commercial fishing industry that had to be evidence-based, had to ba be based on risks that were present. But then the Coast Guard was like, we have no idea how to, to inform this. And so NIOSH began working with them to create hazard assessments, but then really felt like they did not have what those were. And so this developed then this collaboration with academic researchers who can help inform them, um, NIOSH and the U.S. Coast Guard. We're very fortunate. The district that is located here in the Pacific Northwest has a very their vessel safety officer is pretty progressive and has been very forthcoming and a big supporter of, of this collaboration, so it really makes it positive. So we have a unique situation here on the West Coast. But obviously, because we're talking commercial fishing, the West Coast isn't the only place in the United States that fishes. The Gulf Coast also um, has programs, and also the East Coast has programs. So this is what we're talking about today. This is what a crab looks like alive. <laughs> Maybe some of you have seen these crabs as you've eaten them, and hopefully they're not alive at that point. You've cooked them. <laughs> um, so it's all about this Dungeness crab industry. So who in here has eaten Dungeness crab? All of it. Yeah, it is kind of a delicacy. We're very fortunate here um, to have this. This is only um, on the West Coast. It's only harvested in Washington, Oregon, and California. Um, and it has been uh, in the fishing commercially fished um, since the mid-1800s, so a very long time. It is also the most valuable um, commodity in, in the fishing industry. So they get a lot of money for these crabs, and, and so it's very lucrative. It also is, um, the season for it is from December. Usually it opens in December, but because of warming, um, domoic acid has delayed the start of the season. But usually it starts around um, Thanksgiving, so it's kind of you have your Christmas crab. Um, and it's usually harvested in the first um, two months of the season. A, a huge portion of the, the, the fill is in that part of the season. Um, this is kind of um, uh, the Oregon Crab Commission. Um, does a lot of its marketing. So this is their nice infograph that they developed. So this was the year we collected injury information. So you can see kind of what the industry was doing at this time. So along here on the right side is a, um, a graphic of Oregon, because this is only Oregon Crab Commission, so this is only Oregon statistics. But you can see Seaside and Astoria is um, one of the ports with the most um, locally around our area. Newport and Depot Bay also has a huge portion. Um, and then Charleston Coos Bay also has um, a significant portion. So those are the, the bigger ports um, in Oregon. Um, you can also see that um, the X vessel value, the highest, which they're pointing to here, that means the value that they get when the crabber comes in and um, with the landings and um, gives to the processor. That's the money that the crabber actually gets. So, um, so they're making a lot of money. So they made about a million dollars um, from the, in the 2000, as a whole, the industry. So that's kind of busy, but um, you can see. One of the things, <clears throat> fishing management has a, a big role in, in safety. The way that the crab fishery is managed, some fisheries have um, quotas, so they're only allowed with a permit to get so much of the, the seafood. Um, but the crab fishermen, there is no quota. It is by permit, so you're allowed a certain number of pots and a certain size of pots um, for your vessel. So then you can go out and fish as much as you want. And in some phrases, that's called derby style. That means when you can fish, you fish as much as you can so that you get the biggest amount of money. Um, so that's a little bit about that industry. 
So this was our project, and we named it FLIP. And it, we kind of were doing a play on words because when they actually harvest, and I'll show you a short video of it, when they harvest the crab, they actually flip the pot over to get the crab out. Um, the FLIP, in our terms, means Fisherman Lead Injury Prevention Program. So we had three aims. And the first aim of our study was really to explore kind of not fatal injuries. And we'll talk about fatalities briefly, but fatalities have been investigated quite extensively. And um, based on fatalities, this is one of the highest risk um, commercial fisheries. Um, so we're going to explore non-fatal injuries. We were taking the approach, we knew we could get reported data to the Coast Guard, but we knew that wouldn't be a complete picture. So we also did primary data collection. So I'll share that with you a little bit today. We also were interested in uh, um, not only identifying what injuries happened, but identifying the hazards that were associated, like what was associated with those injuries. Um, and that was in the hopes that then we could come up with injury prevention ideas. So that's the entire project. So it was significant because little research had been done with non-fatal injuries. A lot of work has been done um, investigating fatalities, but not many understanding non-fatal injuries. However, non-fatal injuries can have an impact um, on the health because of the low productivity, lost wages, um, decreased quality of life, and in even some cases, disability. Also, because of the different gear that um, fishers use, um, depending on what they are fishing for, um, it is very specific to the fishery. So this study, I think, um, got funded because it was specifically looking at the Dungeness crab fleet and their gear and equipment. Um, and also, I think one of the strengths of this project has been the community-based approach that we used. And so I will describe that um, in this um, talk. <clears throat> so one source of data that we had based on this agreement was that we put the Coast Guard. So just a little bit of background, uh, or the Coast Guard data, the um, marine casualty. So if something happens at sea, and the fishermen don't think they can handle it, they call the Coast Guard. When the Coast Guard, they may investigate or they may not investigate, but a report is filled out, and it's called the um, Report on Marine Casualty. And that does include um, what happens with the vessel, but it also includes what happens with the individuals, the crews, and injuries. Um, what NIOSH, the agreement between Coast Guard and NIOSH, Coast Guard doesn't have the capacity to actually review and develop health surveillance, and so that's what their agreement with NIOSH is. So NIOSH review, reviews the case and ad, actually abstracts information on, on these injuries and circumstances so that then we can develop these hazard assessments. And so it is put into um, a commercial fishing incident database. And that's one of the things with our further project that we're working with NIOSH to really upgrade that and, and expand the capacity of that. So this is where we were able to get data from um, 2002 to 2014 and look at reported traumatic injuries um, to the Coast Guard. So we published this paper. What we found in that paper, so in that 12-year time period, they did have 28 fatalities um, in the Dungeness Crab fleet. So that averages about two fa fatalities per year and one specific vessel incident in 2006 um, that happened off the coast of Oregon, they had a higher fatality, they had more fatalities. 71% um, of those were due to drowning or trauma in 13 specific vessel disasters. And then 29 were, were due to drowning after a crew member fell overboard. So what happens in these vessel disasters, 77% of the vessel disasters were due to poor weather conditions. If you remember, this um, crab season begins usually in December and they do their most amount of fishing in December and January. Um, it is required by Coast Guard that they carry, this is what the bag looks like, this is an immersion suit. Has anyone ever mm -hmm. seen them that have been there? I know Kevin has. So it looks like a Gumby outfit and you're supposed to be able to don it in the drill conducting course, you're supposed to be able to don it. So you don it fully clothed and fishermen wear a lot of clothes because it's December and January and they have the, the slick you know, suits on that are plastic because it's rain and weather resistant. And so imagine trying to get in a Gumby suit with all that gear on. And they're supposed to be able to don it within a minute. 
And so when a vessel occurs, they all in a bag, somewhere stored on the vessel, they have this um, ability to get into a suit that will keep them afloat and alive until a rescue operation can be, until a helicopter comes, a vessel can come to rescue them. They're also required um, by Coast Guard to have these um, lifeboats that um, are electrostatic, so once the vessel goes down, it's automatically deployed and they're trained to get on them. Um, however, when they're on the deck, so that's usually where they would fall overboard, is when they're actually on deck and not down below, um, there's no requirement for them to wear personal flotation devices. That's a PFD. So currently, that is not required, and so it is usually not practiced. And NIOSH has a whole research thing looking. This is a specific design of a PFD um, that is intended to help um, uh, overcome some of the barriers to getting entangled, um, getting your gear entangled and such. So that's not what our research was focused on, but it's good to look at that. So there were 28 fatalities in this 12-year time period. So when we looked at non-fatal injuries, when we were looking at traumatic injuries, we found 45 um, traumatic injuries, and that is a very low number. And when we, when we went back and we had focus groups with fishermen, they were like, see, we're safe. <laughs> now, 45 injuries, that's nothing. We're really safe. Um, and the deal is, is that they don't report all of their injuries um, to the Coast Guard. Usually, um, anecdotally, the fishermen will say they really don't call the Coast Guard unless they need assistance. And if somebody has fractured their arm or something like that, they probably don't think that they need assistance um, or have a cut or a burn. So these are just um, very general, some statistics. Um, the majority of the injuries that were reported to the Ghost Guard um, were reported by deckhands. And so deckhands are the hands-on people doing most of the actual work. The most common injury was a fracture. Um, followed by hypothermia, but amputation and cuts were also um, part of this. We're also interested in looking at the source of the injury, so what caused it. So from the text entries, um, based on the investigation and what was reported by the individual, um, we pulled out what they were. So as you would expect um, in this um, a fishery, they're mostly injured by pots. So 27% of the time they were injured by pots. And the pulley or the block is what actually pulls up. So we'll see if this works. Do I have to hit, maybe I have to hit play. So this is a bird's eye view on a, on a vessel. Oh, and I didn't mean for the sound. It's just kind of loud because you can hear the vessel. But this is the bait guy, so he's chopping bait. Um, this is the block and the pulley. It's a hydraulic block that pulls the crab pot, which is on a line. So they pull the pot up and they flip it over into this table. They have to measure the crab because they're only allowed to take males and they're only to take if the carpus, which is the shell part of it, is a certain length. So, <clears throat> so they pull the crab out and then they measure it and then they put it into a hold which is, keeps the crab alive down below the vessel. So um, when we looked at the injuries, a lot of it had to do with handling the pots um, and working, so hauling the gear up and then also placing the gear or handling the gear um, on deck. Looks a little bit different than our offices, doesn't it? <laughs> a little bit of a contrast there. <clears throat> So let's see if I can. So, um, so after we, that was our very first step, was to look at what was reported to the Coast Guard. But then we knew we would have to get deeper into understanding what the true picture was. Um, and this is where our community engagement uh, became really important. Whenever we were designing this, I um, did meet with Sea Grant, but I also met with people in the marine resource management here on campus and was like, how do you talk to these fishing communities? Like, how do you have these conversations? And what they recommended was to have um, actually community researchers, so people that were from these major ports that we know they are fishing in, and really identifying kind of somebody who's in, within that community that can help open this channel of communication. Um, using this, we were able to conduct focus groups to begin opening the conversation just to hear from fishermen um, what they had. So we had focus groups in Washington, Oregon, and 
California. And it's very interesting. Every port has a completely different personality. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, but we, we did hear essential themes, and we're working on analyzing that. So a lot of qualitative stuff, which is interesting for me to try to handle. Um, from these focus groups, we were really interested in developing a survey. So we were learning from the fishermen what they wanted to express, and we did learn a lot. They felt like they are doing a lot of things to stay safe, and they were like, nobody ever reports out what we are doing and everything like that. So we really did try to capture from them what their ideas are for keeping safe and not just pointing out, well, you're getting injured here, you're getting injured here. Um, so we also wanted to design a survey that they would answer. And so we got a lot of feedback on how that should look and what form that should look. We also conducted interviews. We interviewed um, them to learn more about their work tasks. We were kind of interested in the time they spent in really understanding kind of a work task analysis, like what they actually did, because no one had really looked into that. So it was fascinating conversations about what they actually did. Um, <clears throat> we also um, used these connections to pilot test the survey so that we could distribution. And then we did the surveys um, in 2015. Um, there are a captive audience right before the season starts because they're prepping their gear. So they bring their pots into gear yards and they're actually refurbishing them, painting the buoys restocking them, uh, fixing them and everything. So it's an opportunity to have a captive audience um, to answer the survey. So these are kind of, we, um, or we set out to have nine community researchers so that we could cover all of the major ports. So this is the West Coast. So we go all the way up um, into Washington, the major ports, which I pointed out um, in Oregon. Um, and then we also have several um, uh, sites. Um, in several of these ports in San Luis Obispo, we have a woman who's been on our project since the very beginning. She's a fisherman's wife. Um, she's amazing. <laughs> um, and also in Westport, um, we also have a fisherman's wife um, that works on it. Um, the rest of them have kind of come and gone and work in various capacities. A lot of them as observers um, in the NOAA program, which counts the fish and everything. So they've been on vessels and they know a lot of fishermen. Um, and some of them just kind of community members and know that um, are networked in with the fishing communities. So this is what it looks like. It's very visual, our survey. I just thought I'd show you a come up picture. Because since we were in the gear yards, we knew that they wouldn't read very much. Um, but we wanted to know their fishing history. And we know that crab fishermen also fish for other things in the year. So we kind of wanted to calendar and buy the fishery. Um, so if they fish for crab during that month, they could just circle the crab. And so it was a pretty straightforward way. So we were able to capture which ports they were in and what, what they were fishing for and what months. Um, we also had to collect injury data. Instead of having a list of body parts, we just showed a, an image of something so they could just mark it quickly. Um, we also wanted kind of safety opinions. So we um, used a visual analog scale, so they just had to mark on a scale kind of what they were thinking about specific safety um, things. And it's very short. And our last two questions were open-ended, because we did hear a lot that the fishermen wanted to share um, what they were doing right and what they think um, causes injury. And so we had these open-ended questions um, to analyze. So we got 426 um, survey respondents, so with a nice distribution. This is the number of surveys by the state. So we, um, a lot of them in Oregon, but we did get a lot up in Washington and a lot in down, down in California as well. And as expected, because there's more deckhand captains, you usually have three deckhands, one captain on a vessel, or two deckhands. So the majority, and especially prepping gear, um, we heard a lot from the deckhands. And my um, Sea Grant colleague said, you know, I think this is the first time that anyone's ever actually talked to deckhands and actually listened to them, which is amazing for me because I've worked in occupational health and safety for a long time, and I always talk to the worker first. And I just thought it was amazing that they don't even consider, they talk to the owner and the captain a lot, but they don't even think about the deckhands and their perspectives. So it's been interesting in this project to, to do that. So that was kind of uh, a little bit about that. So the average age of the fishermen was 39 with quite a range, 15 years. The average fishing experience was 17 years. 
um, again, with a wide range of, of experience. But in our data set, um, we had 92 injured fishermen. And so we only asked them one year history, like we didn't ask about their life. We did ask about their lifetime injuries, but we also specifically asked about the past year. So in one year, 92 um, out of our respondents, so 22% of the respondents said that they had some kind of injury, which is a little bit different than reporting 46 injuries in a 12 year period. <laughs> um, and then also we got a lot of kickback. We were like, well, who cares if you cut your finger or bruise? You know, this is a physically demanding job. We don't care. Like, what are you calling an injury? Why does that matter? So we also did ask about kind of the severity of it based on what medical treatment or whether it limited their ability to work. And so out of those 92, almost half of them, they did report as limiting their ability. So these weren't um, just nicks or cuts or anything like that. So in this, um, a lot of the big majority of it were cut or punctures or sprains or strains. Um, when we looked at the Coast Guard reported injury, the leading nature of injury was fracture, you remember? And so fracture was reported um, in this, but it was not the major thing. So other things are going on um, when you do primary data collection and actually look into this. So there was kind of the distribution. We also were interested by their work activity. <clears throat> this mirrored what was reported to the Coast Guard. So the Coast Guard did say that their most common activity at time of injury was hauling or handling the gear. And that's also what we found. It's really the gear um, that causes injuries. So we also looked by um, their position at the time of the injury. So it's not only um, what we found when we were interviewing them, that even though they said they were a captain, sometimes during the fishing, they actually become the deckhand, that they actually go down on the deck and do the work. So when we asked about their injuries, we asked specifically what, what activity or what role were you playing at the time of injury. So again, a lot of injuries happen um, with the deckhand, the percent there. Um, however, the captain and the owner um, <clears throat> do have a role and, and do get injured. So when you do look at the difference between the association of uh, their crew position and at the time of the injury, um, if you do uh, adjust it um, for age and years of fishing, it kind of, it really doesn't matter. There is a slightly more um, for deckhand, but it really, the odds ratio isn't very different between their, their job title, which probably goes into what activity they were doing actually at the time of the injury. So as I showed you, we did ask on a vast scale uh, kind of some of their opinions, and I'm only showing you a few here. Um, so we were interested if we, if they, and this was following some previous NIOSH work, just ask, work, asking them if they were, if they felt it was important to reduce their risk of injury. And you can see the distribution there that a lot of them did strongly agree um, that they, that it is important. Um, when we asked about how much they worry about getting injured, you can see it's a little more flat. Some of them say, I don't worry at all. And some say, well, I do worry. Um, and then when we did ask, we asked as an individual, but we also ask as a crew. As a crew, are you able to um, avoid injury? You know, can they be active in this role of, of, of reducing injury? And they um, largely, again, it's very much skewed to say that they could um, do a lot to, to prevent injuries. When you did kind of a preliminary analysis, just looking at um, that related to whether they were injured or not, whether they had reported an injury, and then what their perception of all these things were. And so you could see, if we, when we asked it to be important to do risk, there's no difference between these two groups. The, the averages are quite similar. When we asked if they use safety equipment or procedures, if they were not injured, they did say, oh, yeah, that's because I use equipment. So that was different. The worry, again, was pretty close. It was kind of middle of the road. They were like, we don't worry. When we talked with our community researchers, like, why don't you think fishermen worry? And they were like, oh, of course they don't worry. They wouldn't go out and fish if they worried about it. So they're not, they're not worriers. They, 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 they want to go out. And so of course they're not worriers. 
Um, when you do ask about the chance of injury, those that haven't been injured are kind of middle of the road, but those who have been injured, it is, um, they do think, they tend to think more that um, their chances are higher. <clears throat> if they can avoid injury, a slight difference, the non-injured, and again, um, as an individual and a the non-injured were slightly higher in, in empowerment, thinking that they could um, prevent injury. So when we asked um, just the open-ended question, we did a cart sorting. We did the sorting of all of these with our community researchers and some key stakeholders in the industry to, to kind of divide these into groupings. And so when you see what they say, when we ask them what they do to stay safe, the number one thing, the most common thing they said is that you have to be aware, kind of like awareness of your surroundings and awareness of yourself in those surroundings. They also said um, very highly, these are kind of the top 10 in order, that good and well-maintained fishing gear and vessel is important. And they also said the crew and the skipper are what's important. Um, they said drills and preparation, self-care, experience, wisdom. I love that. If you're just smart, you won't get injured. <laughs> Um, best marine practices, um, and drug and alcohol free, and then physicality. Kind of similar, when we asked what the cause of injury was um, in their work, they said that heavy work was the cause of injury, poor mental focus and experience, um, weather, sea conditions, an unsafe vessel, um, stupidity <laughs> is always good, <clears throat> drugs and alcohol come up in every list. Um, unsafe attitude, um, lack of training and safety procedures, and then my favorite, just bad luck. Um, so we wanted to, um, the whole intent was then, after we collect this information from them, is to also disseminate broadly. And so we did, um, we worked with a graphic designer and our C grant and the extension um, to develop this kind of poster. <clears throat> we mailed it to all permit holders. Um, and we also had our community researchers go out and share it, go to the docks and share it um, before the beginning of this season and ask for feedback cards to say, okay, this is what you said, you know, what, what do you think about this and what are the ideas you have then um, for staying safe? Um, so this is just a brief summary of kind of everything I just told you, nice and colorful. We got a lot of positive feedback from fishermen. They really like that. And I think they also like, they saw us out there in the gear yards collecting the surveys. I think they like to get it back and to see it. So I think that was good. <clears throat> so now we have this big collection of ideas from everybody. And so the aim three of our grant is to now actually scientifically study whether an intervention works or not, which is really crazy when you let them come up with the ideas and then you're like, huh, how do we then decide whether that's effective? So we're in this process of um, working with um, specific fishermen and specific ideas and trying to pursue them to see kind of what will, what will float, knowing that we also have to take some low-hanging fruit and do some things just to help um, find that. So we're, this is where we are now. So we've gotten a lot of ideas that um, it's been lauded that Sea Grant should have a big safety resource center that is um, possible for that. And my Sea Grant partner is like, no. <laughs> um, but they, they also think that um, training, and they call them greenhorns when they're the fishing, the people just getting into the fishing industry that don't know much, they want to do a lot with greenhorns. They did talk a lot about general health and nutrition. They said that basically they're industrial athletes, like it's a very physical job, but they say that a lot of people don't eat right or take care of their self, themselves. And so we heard a lot about that. <clears throat> we also heard a lot about drug testing. There is no policy that they have to drug test on the vessels, but that came up a lot. Um, they talked about first aid. They are required to take drill conducting course and they're required to have first aid at sea, but none of the first aid classes are like meant for commercial fishermen. They're um, general. And so um, they often do not like the first aid courses. And so we did work with a wilderness um, austere medicine, wilderness um, medicine, um, and come up with a specific thing. So we, are, um, we did that um, before the last season. And so this was our fast fishermen first aid and safety training um, and so we're evaluating that and developing some resources with that um, <clears throat> they did say crew safety um, fishermen training and info 
They were interested in functional movement, strength and balance training. They do have a lot of sprains and strains and musculoskeletal injuries. And they were like, oh, if I just do training, I won't move. And I was like, yeah, but if you don't lift an 80 pound pot, <laughs> that's what will protect you. Um, anyway, and they also say proper um, gear and PPE, housekeeping on the vessel, anti-slip footwear and mats, good lighting. And then some of the things with a block, having pressure relief val valves and pot guides that facilitate them more smoothly, bringing it up. And so we are looking into some of this more um, engineering controls. Um, so just to kind of bring this all together, the fatality rate in the Dungeness crab industry is really high. So we are working um, as health and safety professionals, having these conversations with them about injury prevention, hopefully kind of raises um, some of that. <clears throat> the characteristics of the non-fatal injuries that were reported to the Coast Guard and then reported in our survey are quite different, so it helps us give a more full picture. Um, but always gear handling and hauling, which is essentially the deckhand work, kind of comes up. So are there things that we can work on with that? We, do, we did learn that fishermen do think that it's important um, to prevent injuries, and they do want a safe workplace. Um, they do believe that themselves and the crew prevent injuries, so I think that gives us something to go on. Um, and so I do think that there are opportunities um, with them to, to prevent injuries. So we learned a lot through this process, and we're still um, working on it, so um, it's been fun. So I do have to acknowledge this was supported by um, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health in partnership with NIOSH, and we also work with the Pacific Northwest Agricultural Safety and Health Center, which is at University of Washington, um, that funds our surveillance project. Um, and I do work closely with the Oregon Sea Grant and the Washington Sea Grant on all this work, and so I have to um, give a nod to working with um, them. has been really informed this project, I think, from, from the ground up. And with that, um, this is a vessel in Newport right before the season starts. This is what it looks like when they have all the gear on them <clears throat> before they go out and drop their pots. And there's our nice flip logo. Mm -hmm. So thank you, and I'll take any questions. There are no restrictions on hours, and that's what I was saying, that marine um, fisheries management has found when they do, like, quotas and things like that, then people do say that they know they can only fish so much, so they space it out, and so that they do have more realistic hours of work. But in this particular fishery, um, no, there's no restriction. Once um, The way the season starts is once they give the start date and it's negotiated on the quality of the crab and the price of the crab, the negotiation with the processors. So when they're all set to go um, and up and down the coast, there's different start dates, which complicates it even more. But um, once that start date is set, they can drop their pot three days before. So all the, the ships go out and drop it, and then and that start date, they can start harvesting. And um, what I'm told is in that first six to eight weeks, they go 24-7. They are trying to fill their um, pots as many times and their holds as many times as possible, and they only come back to drop when their hold is full to um, cash in and then go right back out. So no, um, the development of the alternative safety compliance program by the Coast Guard was supposed to be done with industry input, and so we were involved just as spectators to sit in these town hall meetings up and down the coast um, with the Coast Guard, and those conversations, as you can imagine, were very tense. Industry does not want any regulation, does not want anything um, on them, and so it's been tabled for now, these discussions. So, so no, there's nothing currently um, in that besides safety gear that they have to have. So, this is really interesting. You brought up the drug and alcohol issue a number of times. <coughs> so, what's actually known about uh, the extent of drug and alcohol use? It probably wasn't for the first time, I probably missed it. Um, so, what's, <laughs> what do we know? Um, 
are there any uh, efforts to look at those issues in terms of anecdotal? One of the things we are doing, because a lot came up in the, that it, your crew really matters and the vessel, like they kept saying, you got to be on a good vessel and you got to have a good crew. And so we're, we are doing interviews and we just actually just got them all. So we've interviewed now up and down the coast, um, a lot of captain and crew to find out a little bit more about that. And um, the captain and owner of the boat usually have a crew agreement and it, not all crew agreements have that you will be clean and sober and be in good condition when you show up for work. And then they have the right then to let you go if you're not. Um, not all have them, but the few that I spoke with and the few that I read um, say that that's integral, that you have to have that in there. But I don't think anyone knows. But then anecdotally, whenever, if you ever talk with a fisherman and you ask about these events, because, you know, it's in the news when a vessel goes down, so everyone knows all the vessels. So, like, I had just interviewed for this crew dynamics last week, and he just went on and on about every vessel. And he's like, oh, that they were a bunch of meth heads, or they, this vessel like he's like you know which vessels are going to have issues because you know the culture of that vessel and so they all point to the other people and so that's all i know is anecdotally a few things and i'm not sure um we did not we specifically we thought about asking that in our survey and we were told not to um but it is on the coast guard form whether drugs and alcohol were an issue on that um, so I don't think it's truly known, but that I think is exactly it, that you're demanding a lot of people, and so I think a lot of the crews do have supplements to help them stay awake for 24-7. So it sounds like there's anecdotal evidence for <clears throat> issues that could be addressed, but a lot of reluctance to even ask about it or to try to intervene as an outside person. Like the boat captain... Mm -hmm. And they see it also as a societal. I mean, a lot of these vessels do have family members um, that are, you know, a lot of the vessels are owned by somebody, and then they have their family members. So, um, not all, um, and they know who good, good crew is. Um, so I think it's also broader. It's not just the commercial fishing industry, but the coastal communities and such. It's a very um, unique situation, I think. <laughs> But this is the only time, like when I when we did the focus groups and we talked to Dungeness crab fishermen, they're like, we don't talk to each other. Like they're also very. Um, so this was also a stretch to get them to kind of share and and everything. And I think um, they're very leery of talking to people and very leery of any kind of regulation or anything. And so I think anything that touched on like drugs and alcohol, they were like, we're not going to go there. But they all bring it up. Everyone you ever talked to, they were like, if, 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 if we just didn't have drugs out here, everyone would be safe. <laughs> Kevin? I noticed that the numbers of surveys were relatively evenly distributed. Did that hold true for injuries and accidents as well? Or did, or were there places that seemed <coughs> more, more risky or less risky? Um, that's a good question, and I, what I recall is that there wasn't um, a difference that it was distributed. Where we asked surveys, we pretty much got the same uh, number of injuries. There wasn't like a super high rate in certain, certain ports and not others. And what about, um, is there a, a, a much of a range in vessel size and crew complement, or, or are all the boats pretty much more or less alike, or did you know there trends in injuries relating to it? Yeah. Or, a lot of the crab boats are smaller and tend to have smaller crews. A lot of them, the most crew they would have is five. Um, so crew size um, in this industry isn't as diverse as in other um, fisheries, because in other fisheries there is a big disparity. There can be very small vessels but very large vessels. But there is a distribution. Not all of them um, are under what is going to be in the new alternative safety compliance, which regulates it, I think, to 25 feet. So. Some, when we looked at our data set, some were over that and some were under that. But in general, there's usually only three to five crew on a Dungeness Crab vessel. Either way, both of you. You said that this is the second most dangerous fishery, so what would you mean by that? Shrimpers and the Gulf Coast have the highest fatality rate, and then followed by Dungeness Crab. It's the rate. <laughs> so they have a lot more fishermen that 
fish for shrimp down on the Gulf Coast. Uh, one question I have, when you were kind of classifying each of the injuries, mm -hmm. did you guys kind of go more into depth about what type, like, not to say what type, but the extent of the injury? Because, like, strictly medical speaking, if you're talking about the amputation, just like losing a part of your finger, can you classify them as an amputation? Or, like, for example, is it like a small cut or is it a laceration? We did try to get that. This was self-reported, so it's not a medical record, um, but we did try to identify, based on the questions, we did ask what kind of medical treatment they received and whether they received it on the vessel or they waited and got went into a clinic or a hospital once they returned to try to get it at that, like what more is there. Um, so we probably don't have as much medical information, but we do, of course, from what I showed here, we do have a little more information to get at that severity. <coughs> Just a quick follow-up question. It's, I have complete ignorance as to how far away from the coast they're actually going. So I'm curious if yeah, there is... Yeah, crab like, fishery is actually quite close. Yeah. <clears throat> and that's one of the reasons why they have vessel disasters, because at all the ports, um, at least in Oregon, is where the rivers go out. And so there's bars. And when the weather is inclement, the waves and everything. So a lot of the disasters happen in visible sight from the shore, like within the three miles of the shore. Crab, that's where they hang out. So that's where they fish for them. But go on with your question. Well, it was just because I was thinking, is that a barrier to seeking care in the events of, I'm sure everything that takes away from productivity is a barrier to seeking care. But in the context of an injury, it would, it would seemingly make a difference to you if you could get into port relatively quickly versus could not. And yeah. Is there, some sort of, is there any sort of idea of negligence where something happens and someone's left to sit on it, there's no ability. I mean, I can't speak to that just anecdotally when they, like, sitting in the first aid classes and listening to what they, what they do. Um, I think that it's all about the money. Like, they do not want to quit crabbing, and if somebody just has something that they feel like they can put duct tape on and then wait until the hold is full and go back. Um, and, um, and I think they are worried. I think captains are worried about getting sued. And, and it's in the, 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 I should also say it's a different setting than regular workplaces where people are covered by workers' comp. They're not covered by workers' comp out on the vessel. So it's a different um, environment and, um, because of laws. Um, but they do some vessels, and I also heard this from good, the good captains, that you have to have insurance. Not everyone has insurance. But those that do have insurance, they would have the ability to, and that's the good captains, they were like, I take care of my people. Like they, they would never say that they wouldn't um, provide treatment and medical care um, in a timely fashion um, for there. So I, I don't think it's negligence. I think it's just how money goes. And the, the deckhands themselves are also aligned with the owners because they get shares, not hourly pay. So they are also incentive to work through stuff because yeah. you're getting a share, not a wage. Correct. That is that's a good point to bring in. Yeah. I worked on offshore oil rigs where there's always a twelve on, twelve off kind of system. Why why would they do the twenty four seven instead of having <laughs> Your guess is as good as mine. But I think they just want to bring in as much as possible. And they do say that they share, like they will try to give like one person rest for some amount of time to rotate people. But I've never heard them say that they would ever embrace a schedule because that has been, uh, fatigue was very much a talk at the, the alternative safety compliance things. And there was no, the fishermen would not go there. You'd have to double your crew, right? <coughs> or, or else double the number of days. Yeah, I think we've had great conversations with them. Um, and I think they've just never had this conversation before. And I think it's more of that. Mm -hmm. And it was really funny because when we said we were going to collect this survey, a lot of people were like, you'll never, nobody will ever fill in a survey. We will never do that. And, and I actually went in Newport and collected the surveys. And walking around the gear yard, it helped that we handed out gloves. <laughs> They were working on their um, pots, and so they get a lot of nicks. And we were like, here's a pair of gloves. 
for a dollar fifty. Um, anyway, um, so we gave them the gloves whether they filled in the survey or not. And it was amazing. They would sit there and talk to me for a very long time. Actually, like once you get them going, they're they're very um, anywhere. I've never worked with an industry or a worker that once you start talking to them about the work that they won't talk to you. It's just breaking that seal. And I think um, I think we were able to do that. And I think our community researchers. I certainly didn't go up and down the coast. I only went to Newport to talk to fishermen, just because of my physical location. Um, but I think all the, the ones, and it's actually very interesting to the community researchers. We meet with them once a year. Um, we're meeting with them next week, actually, um, in Newport. And just their experiences throughout this project from the get-go, like all the fishermen's wife were like, the only reason why we're involved is we're making sure you're behaving. Like, you know, you researchers, we don't want you doing anything. And we, I've, we've tried to listen to them and incorporate in all of their their thoughts and everything, um, and it's really, um, the emails now that I get from the community research researchers are like, thank you so much. I mean, I get really nice emails saying, you know, you've ne we've never had these conversations and we haven't had this. So I don't know that there's one thing that surprised them, but I think just this general conversation on a broader level and hearing them hearing that other fishermen um, have ideas or are talking about it and stuff, I, I don't know, we'll see. <clears throat> Mike? Do you have any sense of when these injuries are occurring? Like, is it during rough seas and more than during calm seas? Is it when they've been up for 24 hours as opposed to during the first couple hours? <clears throat> we did um, try to capture that because we asked when they were injured. And so we know when the, that intense season is. Um, and we did ask if they were tired um, when they were injured. So we didn't want to ask, you know, how many hours had you been sleeping because they're recalling back a year. And so we didn't think we would get fine um, information on that. And so as I recall, but Victor may recall differently, but I don't think that they're, I mean, they are getting injured when they're fishing. And so um, I think there were more injuries in um, the first two months, <clears throat> like in December and January. But that's only because then they're not fishing. Then they get injured in the when they they all fish tuna or they fish shrimp after that. For these data, all we have is their self-report of being fatigued, or their self-report that there were inclement weather conditions. So it's yeah. entirely their definition. For some of the surveillance work we're doing, we could actually connect that to weather status and sea status in a way we can't with these birds. Mm -hmm. So we're hoping to get a be better handle on that. Bridget? So I'm sure you have uh, you know, thought about this too, and I, I'm just wondering from like a, a, a vessel perspective, is there any way to link the amount of money they earn to their, their injury level? Or yeah, their and actually, I, I, yeah, and I don't know that we can get it down to the vessel, but they did um, want us to look at it relative to landings, like these yeah. statistics they take on landing costs. But I don't, you can't get, it's not publicly avail available, the granular level. Um, but looking at the economics of it, it has been brought up to us, and it's something maybe we can explore, like with the surveillance. We've talked about bringing in that and seeing if there are trends with that. Because you can see it goes up and down, the, the cost of it. And I think it's totally relative to how much they go and fish. And it has to do with the price and their economics that year, whether they'll get more money fishing for tuna that year than concentrating on the crab. So. I was going to ask if you would even look at the report of how much do they think that the crew can help with safety? Like, mm -hmm. Is there something about that crew culture that is so important? Yeah, and that's what we're trying to get at with interviews. Yeah, there is something to that. They do all say the inexperience and new crew, and but also just the um, relationship with the captain. Like the captain I interviewed, he's like, I'm really hands off. I let them go down to the deck, and I don't tell them what to do, but I'll go down there if I need to. You know, <laughs> So it's really funny. I think they do have different ways of approaching it, and I do think that that's interesting. Yeah. So is it all, are there suggestions to do We actually learned some of the things about the block and like the guides for the pots. It seems we're trying to get more information on that because it seems like some fishermen know about it, but some don't. And so we're wondering if it isn't just a sharing of ideas that um, some of them had what they called a banger bar. 
So when they brought it up to the table that there's an actual physical bar there that can be removed, but when they bring the pot over, if they don't have a bar there, they actually bring it all the way to the table and then they shake it to get the crab out. So if there's a bar that's um, a little bit off of the table, higher than the table, when they bring the pot on, it bangs against the bar, hence they call it banger bar. And so when they bang it on the bar, it, um, their posture doesn't go down, so they get less fatigue. Um, but then also the banging on it helps get the crab out, and they're not physically shaking it. So to me, I was like, oh, that's brilliant. Why doesn't everyone have that? But then I'm getting more information about why some people don't and some people do. And we're actually, we're hoping in the next season to maybe test that, identify vessels that don't have it, interview them, then help them financially get it installed, and then measure them throughout the season to identify whether it, in fact, did improve their productivity and their safety. So that is um, going forward. We're, we are, I am more interested in looking at the, and we also, it was um, uh, the, uh, you know, the deadliest catch. So they were filming up in Alaska, but Alaska has done so much to improve safety up there that they got bored. So they actually filmed in Newport, um, not last season, but the season we were doing this, they were filming in Newport. So in 2014-15, and I think they call it Dungeon Cove, Ooh, Oregon. I did not because it was so too painful. So the <laughs> they were. <laughs> Yeah, I had the Discovery Channel call me many times, and the OSU media is like, oh, you should talk to him. I was like, you are kidding me. Like, no way. <laughs> um, but, um, but speaking to that, but they had it, they did film in the very last episode of it um, when they were filming. Um, the block actually fell on a crew member, and it's because it's a Davit crane that um, goes over, and the pin in the crane going over failed, and like it came because of the rough seas and everything kind of came out, and so it fell. And so one of the fishermen I was talking to, he was just like, those idiots, they should just, when you put the pen in, you fix it, you know, you chain it to it so that you, that davit chain can't come out. And I was like, that, that's what you need to learn. Like, everyone should always just have a pressure relief valve and a davit chain, and then you don't have failure of equipment falling on people and having traumatic injuries. So, so it'll be interesting to see if we can test that. Mary? Yeah, I'm just wondering, I was really interested in your comment about uh, helping Niners improve um, this data collection. I forget the name of the, of the database that they're using. CFED, Commercial yeah, Fishing so Incident Database. So that seems like it has really <coughs> potentially broad implications for what we know about what's going on and then potentially what people are doing about it. So can you say just a word about that? Yeah, currently... CFID, the Commercial Fishing Incident Database, only collects vessel disasters, so when a vessel um, sinks, um, and then uh, fatalities. So it doesn't collect non-fatal fatal injuries, and it doesn't collect casual vessel casualties. So just when a vessel um, has a fire or something and it just needs rescue, um, it doesn't go into that database. So the idea, they are just literally one or two people there at NIOSH, and so they haven't had the time to expand, and that's why... We are helping them. We're also bringing in um, insurance data. The Coast Guard is starting to have um, the insurance, the marine insurance companies are, they're requesting that they upload into a central system all of the marine casualties um, in the United States. So nobody's looked at that data yet, and so we, we are hope, we keep being told that it's going to be there um, soon. So we hope in this five-year period they actually get the data, and so we'll be able to incorporate the information from that. So we're um, supplementing it by adding in the non-fatal injury, a mechanism for adding in non-fatal injuries, as well as this um, marine. And we're also looking at the trauma registries in Oregon and Washington because there are trauma hospitals along the coast that potentially see fishermen. So we're working with the Oregon Health Authority and mining the data to see if we can get any details, met more medical details on the injuries if they present um, to any of the trauma hospitals. Great. It's been a robust yeah. discussion. We're right at the end. I'm sure Laurel will be happy you. to answer any more questions. Yeah, thank you.